based on our discussion of the law of signs, um, we never talked about what happens when we have two sides and the non-included angle, because sometimes with that case, the triangles we might be able to construct, well, it's actually ambiguous with the given information. And what I want to make clear is that our textbook seems to imply that every side-side angle triangle is ambiguous, but that is not always true. Um, it is possible in these circumstances that you could have no possible triangles or one possible triangle. Um, but it doesn't seem like IB really acknowledges this. It seems like, from my understanding so far, that they want you to check for an ambiguous case where you'd have two triangles anytime you're given side-side angle. And my assumption would be that if, for some reason, you it isn't possible to have two triangles from the side-side angle that you're given, something would come up in your working that would be illogical or that wouldn't make sense. Maybe you come up with um, an undefined value for sine. Maybe you come up with a negative angle, stuff like that, stuff that wouldn't make sense in the context of the problem. Regardless, in an ambiguous case or in, in any case where there's some sort of ambiguity in math, right, and in this case, two triangles can be constructed from the given information. Uh, I just want to add this in here, and in any ambiguous problem. We want to follow this rule. But in an ambiguous case in law of signs, two different triangles can be constructed from the given information. We don't know which one to solve, so we have to consider both cases. Or more generally, you have to consider all cases if this were not a law of signs problem. Right? Anytime there's a point where you can't concretely reason out a single possible outcome, you have to consider them all. Um, so in this case, if we can't reason out one definite outcome, we need to consider them both. So let me explain how this works, because it seems a little bit uncertain, it seems a little bit overwhelming. But here's what happens, right? We're given a triangle. We're given a B and C, and we're told that side AB is 10, side BC is 7, and angle CAB is 30 degrees. Now I want to find all the remaining sides and angles of all possible triangles, and this time I give it to you, that there are going to be multiple cases. Here's what happens with this triangle. If I just bring this triangle over here for a second. A couple of things can happen. I can either draw the triangle the way I have it, or because of the nature of this triangle, right? Because what essentially happens is this short side, this seven, falls in a way that it's greater than the height of the triangle. And what that means is we can actually take it if we wanted to, instead of drawing it here, we can swing it out the other way and it still satisfies the given information. right? So I could have two legs. One leg where I originally drew it here or one leg in here that I also need to consider. And I actually have two triangles that get formed with a lot of the same information but with some slightly different information. I'll kind of show you what I mean with this problem too. If I we consider this and I get rid of this here. Maybe there it goes. All right. If I consider that I can redraw this triangle in a way that I can still have a length of seven units on that side, but draw it this way, well, then I'm still using all the information I'm given. I just don't know which one is right. And then when you don't know which one is right, you have to consider both. So here's how it works. We're going to call this one on the top case one. And we're going to call the one on the bottom. Oops, we're going to call the one on the bottom case two. So here's case one and here's case two. So in case one, we're going to 
operate like normal for now uh, because I have enough information to do law of sines, right? I can do sine A over A equals sine C over C. And I want to find side C. So not a problem. Let's see, I got sine 30 over 7 equals sine C. Oh, sorry, I want to find angle C over 10. I can do that. I get sine C is equal to 10 sine 30 over 7. And if I just use my calculator here, I can enter that in pretty quickly. Again, make sure you're in degree mode. So I'm going to do 10 sine of 30 divided by 7. All right, so I have sine C is equal to 0.714. I'm going to give you a few more than three significant figures for now. And remember to undo a sine, I'm going to take the inverse sine. So C is equal to inverse sine of that number. And that's going to give me 45.6 degrees. I'm realizing I need to make all of this a lot smaller so I have some room. Let's shrink this. So I've got angle C in this case. Label it. I can find my missing angle, right? Because the sum of all three angles has to add up to 180 degrees. So I'm going to have 75.6 plus B equals 180. So I'm going to get B equal to what? 70. Nope. 104.4 degrees and then I can go ahead and use my law of sines again sine of a over a equals sine of b over b get sine of 30 degrees over 7 equals sine of 104.4 degrees over b and with some manipulation Sine of 30, I get 13.56 or 13.6 if I use my three significant figures. Great, this is all good. This is 13.6. Great. Well, now that I've got all this other information, how do I find this other triangle? Because it seems like this is the one concrete solution. Well, again, because I drew this, I swung this angle in, right? If I were to actually draw out the whole rest of my triangle here, if I were to kind of draw this out the way it originally was, so here's the rest of the triangle that I had from case one. This is 45.6. Well, what happens because you remember from ge geometry, right? This is seven and this is seven. So this is an isosceles triangle. And what we learned with isosceles triangles is that their base angles, the angles opposite the um, congruent sides are equal, 45.6 degrees, which means my new angle C forms a straight line, this is a different color, forms a straight line with 45.6 degrees. And we know that there are 180 degrees in a straight line, straight angle. So this is 180 minus 45.6 degrees is going to be 134.4. So the way we find sine or our new C, so I'm going to call our case one side C. C1 and our case two side C or angle C, excuse me, C2. The way we find C2 every single time is 180 minus C1. So we'll always apply this little trick here, which we just did, right? So we have C2 equals 134.4, which now means I can also find our new B because it's just going to be. 
Let's see, 180 minus the sum of my other two angles. And it usually gives me kind of a small number, right? I'm going to get 180 minus 164.4, so I'm going to get 15.6. And from here, I can just apply my law of sines again, right? I can just say sine of A over A equals sine of B over B. I get sine of 30 degrees over 7. I get sine of 15.6 degrees over B. And after doing some rearranging, I get an approximate answer of 7 sine 15.6 divided by sine 30. We get about 3.76. So the trick here, kind of the confusing part, is just getting out of the weeds of moving from case one to case two. Once you go from case one to case two, it's just more law of sines. But the trick is really in kind of adjusting using this 180 minus C1 bit here. Um, and once you can adjust, it's business as usual. But that, that adjustment step is what can be tricky for a lot of people if they're, not, if they're not used to it or if they don't know that it's coming. So we do have to be careful there.